you myself. All right, are you ready? Three, two, one, start it. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to a talk actually uh, by uh, Peter Lepping. He's actually speaking to us from England, and um, I'm hoping that you can see this particular slide. Um, he works in the Wrexham area, which is uh, just on the border of Wales and England. It's a very old market town founded before the 11th century. So, you know, we're dealing with a great deal of history. Just out of interest, um, I was raised in Devon, uh, that's southwest England, below Wales. Um, and you can see the county town Exeter, where the E is, the first E, that's where I grew up. So um, this is a very, very beautiful part of England, as you can see with the Welsh mountains, um, and uh, very laconic. But uh, now what I'd like to do is just introduce Peter and uh, tell you a little bit about his history. Um, Peter completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Münster in Germany, and then moved to England in 1995, where he completed his postgraduate education in and around Liverpool and Northern Wales. Between 2004 and 2017, he was a community consultant a psychiatrist in Wrexham. And since then, he has been liaison consultant at the Wrexham Maylor Hospital. He was the associate medical director of, for ethics, capacity and consent for the Betsy Calderwider, I'm butchering the Welsh there. Peter, you can correct me on that one, university. Uh, local Health Board and is part of the uh, new North Wales Centre for Mental Health and Society. His Master's is in Medical Ethics and he won several research prizes for his work. Peter's research includes violence and aggression, delusional infestation, capacity, medical ethics, translational research and systematic reviews. Peter was appointed honorary professor by Bangor University in Wales and by the Mysore Medical College and Research Institute in India. He has published over 160 papers and book chapters and he serves as an editorial board member of a number of prestigious psychiatric journals. Uh, the way I met Peter was um, I worked with, as many of you know, um, numerous delusions of infestation or of infestation cases here at the station and felt that we needed to have a symposium um, which occurred last November at the annual meeting for the Entomological Society of America. Peter and uh, 12 other experts, dermatologists, psychodermatologists, um, to name a few other entomologists, veterinary entomologists came together and did the symposium and then Peter has now very generously um said that he'd like to speak to you about his work and so i'm now going to pass you over to peter um enjoy the talk thank you thank you very much i'm just trying to uh share the slides i hope that will work so yes it's actually the betsy cadwallada university health board which is basically the north wales uh organization that is responsible for any health care, primary and secondary care that is delivered in the north of Wales. We cover about just under a million people and quite a substantive geographical area. I want to talk to you today about delusional infestation. Uh, I run a clinic in Liverpool with the School of Tropical Medicine, which is once a month and where we've seen almost a hundred people by now over the years with suspected delusion infestation and I'll go a little bit into that later. So I've seen quite a lot of people with this very debilitating illness and uh, uh, I've done quite a bit of research. There aren't many international uh, clinics where you have a combination of a psychiatrist with a physician, uh, but we do find that these clinics seem to be particularly successful in engaging patients and persuading them to take medication. So this is one of my favorite mountains, Small Shabbat, which is about an hour's drive from where I live. 
and I think one of the reasons why I'm still here despite Brexit is because of this beautiful countryside and because I like the people. Uh, but coming back to delusion infestation, the definition is that of a delusional illness. So we're, lo uh, we're looking at delusion infestation as an illness characterized by a fixed belief that either the patient, him or herself, or their immediate environment is infested by something. And this something can be either living or non-living organisms. So we're looking at insects, parasites, uh, small living creatures, worms, but we're also looking at any kind of threads or fibers that people might identify as the alleged pathogen. And there has to be an absence of medical evidence for that infestation. Previously, there were all sorts of different names for this, and uh, I have published one big review on delusional infestation back in 2009. And I think there are about 30 names that have been uh, used for delusional infestation over the over the centuries, actually. But we now call it delusional infestation, and there are good reasons for that. I think the most common ones that you have probably come across is the word dermatozonwan, which was uh, coined by the Swedish psychiatrist Ekbom in the 1930s, when most of the uh, um, scientific literature was still in German. So he wrote in German about this. Later, it was then called Ekbom syndrome after him. And probably the most recent one that is still occasionally used is delusional parasitosis. But there are reasons why it's not a very particularly good name because it's most people don't think that uh, parasites are the problem. So what is the clinical presentation? By and large, people believe that they have sensations that are caused by some kind of infestation. So people commonly have itches, they have skin lesions or skin problems, but they can also have generalized symptoms like malaise, fatigue, generally feeling unwell, and often they have crawling sensations either on their skin or uh, underneath their skin. They may also have symptoms uh, suggestive of something coming out of their eyes or their nose or other orifices. And uh, sometimes they think that their environment is infested. So they might think that the infestation is in the whole house, in their car, on their bed, in their clothes. Very often they think that they might be contagious. I've had one uh, patient who I still remember to this day um, who felt that her whole house was infested with rats. And she even got herself into the Wrexham leader, which is the local rag where she lambasted the environmental services for not being able to get rid of the uh, rid of the pest. And it was amazing how the antipsychotic amisulpride actually got rid of the pest. But she spent her entire days in a local supermarket cafe because she wouldn't want to be at home. In the night, she kept the lights on. It was terrible for her and her children. So this is how debilitating this illness can be. Uh, the other thing that is a problem is that people normally go to GPs, primary care physicians or dermatologists. They don't go to psychiatrists because why would they? They don't think they have a psychiatric illness. And that also makes it difficult to establish the real prevalence. Uh, but we think it's a relatively rare illness. We think there's about 100 uh, new cases per year per million. That's what we roughly think, but there are far, far fewer in psychiatry. So most of these people go to uh, various physicians. There's a lot of doctor hopping going on, 
but of course they never hear what they want to hear. People often come with what they consider to be evidence of their infestation. So in the olden days, people uh, came with matchboxes where they put in uh, some, usually some skin debris, which they thought was evidence for their infestation. Now they normally uh, have gone with it with the time. So most people now come with, for example, digital photography, videos, but people do still scratch and even use knives to carve out some of those alleged uh, worms or parasites or infestations. Excessive cleaning and scratching is understandable under the circumstances. The use of pesticides uh, and other um, over-the-counter medication and sometimes things they find on the internet is not uncommon. It's not uncommon that people bathe in bleach. They might also bathe their children in bleach, which obviously causes even more problems. That is often secondary itching because of super infections, because if you scratch your skin enough, you get infections into the wounds and that causes additional uh, in, in infections, which then give you more itching. Often because of the way that people uh, use all their hours in the day to get rid of the pests, they have reduced social contacts. Often they avoid their own accommodation. They may also do that because they think they're contagious. And most people have a vastly reduced quality of life. And I've seen people who got divorced, sold their houses, lost their jobs and all sorts. Dangerous attempts to get rid of the alleged uh, infestation is not uncommon, and that's a real risk with this illness. Now, delusion infestation comes in various uh, shapes and forms because it depends a little bit on whether people think their main problem is the skin or whether it's more of a systemic infestation. But we do have uh, a very particular separation between primary and secondary delusion infestation. So the secondary is easy because it's basically where you develop symptoms of delusion infestation as part of another illness. And that can broadly be categorized into uh, symptoms uh, secondary to psychiatric illnesses. Particularly common are dementia, schizophrenia and depression or a medical illness, particularly common are any kind of neurological illnesses like post-stroke, but also uh, other illnesses that give you paresthesia like diabetes or uremia, which of course uh, causes itching, uh, which uh, as you will uh, know, some of the cancers do, for example. But then we also have substance induced delusional infestation, and that's particularly common with any kind of stimulant. So cocaine, crack cocaine, amphetamines, but also antibiotics. And I've seen cases myself after the use of erythromycin. So never underestimate the possibility of psychosis coming from antibiotic use. Steroids and non steroidals are also. Uh, implicated, but there's a whole list in this 2009 um, publication. About 30 things have been implicated so far as a secondary um, issue. Now, a primary delusional disorder is basically, as you can see in ICD 11 or the equivalent in DSM 5 is a delusional disorder that arises de novo, so it's not triggered by another illness. It was previously called a monodelusional disorder in ICD-10. There are special forms and uh, uh, for example, one is a shared delusion. So if one or more people share your delusion, that would be called a folie a deux or a folie a trois. Uh, if you have a double delusional infestation, that means that someone shares your delusion who can't articulate that. 
So that could be a small child or a pet. And you can have delusional infestation by proxy, which is when you are the ill person, but you think that another person or pet is actually the one with the symptoms. Now that can be particularly um, devastating if it's your child whom you think has those symptoms because you may then bathe the child in bleach to get rid of the infestation and that can cause and trigger alarm and uh, child safety procedures. Roughly 40 to 50 percent of all presentations are primary and 50 to 60 are secondary. Now, the reason why we now call it delusional infestation is really because we have a development that we see in psychiatry quite regularly, with, uh, which is one of psychotic theme change. And that means that over time, people think that different things are implicated in whatever they've got. So the delusional content theme has changed over time. We see this, for example, with paranoid delusions as well. Uh, when you live in Europe and you work in Europe as a psychiatrist, then you will find that in the 40s and 50s, people most commonly believed that Nazis were after them. After that, it was the KGB. Uh, then it became the CIA. And now in the last 10 years or so, a lot of people think that pedophiles are after them. So those kind of things change. And the same is happening with the delusional theme of infestation. So in the 19th century, we had delusional themes of scabies, typhoid or the pest. And in the 20th century, that moved first to insects and then later to parasites in the latter part of the 20th century to viruses, bacteria, and then non-living pathogens. And one particular subsection of this is the 21st century phenomenon of what's been termed Morgellons. Uh, and that interestingly is only really common in English and German speaking countries because it's been uh, propagated by the internet. And you might know that uh, English and German together make up about 65% of the entire internet's content. So in those countries, it's particularly common to think uh, that you have this so-called Morgellons disease. We can talk about that in more detail if you like, but essentially it's a subtype of delusional infestation. Insects remain common as a theme, and you can see that uh, in a 2010 study, we found that the alleged pathogens were still mainly organic, uh, about three, three quarters. Insects were most common, but parasites were only 13%. Mites, animals, lice and worms were common in my clinic in Liverpool because it's with the uh, School of Tropical Medicine. Most people in our clinic thinks, think they're infested with worms. And the non-organic are things like fibers, threads, and other in environmental uh, infestations. So we felt the name infestation does emphasize the constantly changing pathogens much better. So it's likely to cover all present and future variations of the theme. And most people have now adopted this term. So this is uh, the currently uh, going term for the illness and I think it's probably going to stay like that because it does encompass any future changes. Here you can see the age and sex distribution and this comes out of a 1988 uh, very big PhD that a guy called Trabert did in uh, Germany. That's probably the biggest single investigation about delusion infestation ever done by anybody. He had over 1,300 patients. He only found 10 real infestations in that group. And you can see that it's more common in females and more common in an elderly population. That's partly because uh, one of the big risk factors is um, any 
any kind of impairment of your sight. And that's understandable because people will uh, misinterpret things they think they see when they have a, a, in, an impediment of their sight. Now again, this is probably what North Wales would look like now. Unfortunately, I can't go there because we're in complete lockdown again. And because my daughter's been diagnosed with COVID, I haven't left the house for about a week. I've actually had COVID myself in March last year, and I can't recommend it. Now, moving on to uh, criteria for delusions. How, how do we make a diagnosis of a delusion? It's important to start with the Swiss psychiatrist Karl Jaspers, who put down the criteria for delusions uh, for the first time ever in 1913. He talked about an extraordinary conviction and a subjective certainty. That's the subjective Gewissheit in the German original. And it cannot be influenced by experience or logical conclusions. So there's a degree of imperviousness or, or fixed belief that uh, comes with it. And then Jaspers defined that the content has to be impossible, the uh, Unmöglichkeit des Inhalts. And once you are in that state, every new information will be interpreted within that new belief system. And that is what is called Wahnarbeit or delusional elaboration or delusional work. And we see that very often in people who have quite elaborate delusional systems. So what is happening? Um, normally, when we go about our day to day business, we normally do a lot of predicting. And you could even say with Descartes, uh, I predict, therefore I am, because that's how we learn. So as a child, you would have walked uh, through the door because you, you thought that you can walk through it, you bumped into it, and so you found out that the prediction that you can walk through the door was a prediction error, and that's why you learned that the little handle is probably a better way of going through the door. So this is what we do. We make predictions and we uh, test them all the time, and then we change our predictions accordingly. So what we try to do is uh, we try to make sure that whenever we have something like I have a feeling that something is going on under my skin, we would then make a prediction. And normally our prediction would be, oh, that's probably nothing and it's going to go away. And then an hour later it's gone. So the prediction was correct. However, if you have a problem with your dopaminergic uh, with with dopaminergic network systems that are responsible for the way that you interpret those uh, those predictions and those um, sensations that you have. If you have a problem with those pathways because of dopaminergic overstimulation, you get to make errors of probabilistic reasoning. And those errors basically mean that you consider the unlikely to be the likely. So whilst normally you would say, oh, it's probably nothing and it's going to go away, you would then think, oh, I might be infested. And then you would test that like you normally do. But when again you have a problem with your pathways that test those predictions, then you can falsely attribute uh, to that prediction that it was correct. So that's basically how it works. And, and that's how delusional elaboration works as well. And it's normally to do with dopaminergic overstimulation in the pathway that interprets the sensations that you have. So when we now use Jasper's criteria, we're less worried about the falsity of what people say. 
because very often we can't check the content of a delusion. For example, if someone says the CIA is after me, I can't ring in Langley and say, are you after John Bloggs in Wrexham? So I haven't got any way of checking that. So what I need to do is I actually need to look at how likely it is that this is possible. And the main aspect is what the explanatory model is that the patient puts forward. So the more likely the explanatory model is, the less likely it is that it's a delusion. But if there, if the evidence of the patient is that they've seen two black cars in the morning outside their house, then that's probably not convincing. So you can see how when people make the case for those infestations and they have symptoms that are not in keeping with any infestation and what they say is not in keeping with a known uh, infestation, then you start to think that it's probably delusional. So it depends on the explanatory models that the patient comes with uh, and, the, and the way in which it is a fixed belief. But again, a delusion isn't a dichotomous thing because you can have delusional intensity that is changing. So delusional intensity comes on a sliding scale. And after seeing a psychiatrist who asks you to reality test your beliefs, it might go down a bit. So your delusional intensity reduces. But then you see the black cars again and hey presto, you're fully deluded again. So it's a sort of changing thing, which is important to, uh, to recognize and to remember. Symptom formation is how symptoms develop. And we talked about the errors of probabilistic reasoning and the prediction of infestation that is not dismissed. So you have a failed reality test, and that is basically uh, how we get to a delusion and quite an elaborate delusional system. At that point, criticism or alternative views are no longer allowed by the dysfunctional belief system. And that is where uh, you get problems. And I can see that the video player stopped working, so I don't know what's going on, but I suppose I will just carry on for now. Um, okay. So when we look at the specimen sign, we have a study from 2011 from Hulva, which shows that 74 people came with a positive specimen sign. So they had some kind of what they considered to be proof with them. Now, this was an American study. Uh, in Europe, we had about 50% who came with such a sign. In our clinic in Liverpool, it's a little bit higher than that. It's uh, more towards 70% as well. So that's uh, always useful to have that because you can actually examine those specimen and then you can tell people what it is that they see. I would now like to go, I would now like to uh, go through some of the important papers that have come out recently, just to give you a sort of overview of what's been going on uh, more, more recently and what the evidence is for this. So, and the Hulver paper showed that A, 74% came with the specimen, but it also showed that there was no evidence of objective skin disease or infestation. So none of the people who presented had any kind of actual skin infestation, and most of them had uh, what turned out to be skin debris. We showed in uh, almost 150 patients that most of the uh, particles or specimen that people brought in uh, were, were skin particles uh, or otherwise hair and occasionally other things. We did have one actually where there was a real 
uh, dead louse, but that did not explain the symptoms that the patient was presenting with. So it is possible that you get an accidental uh, finding of something, but then of course you have to decide whether that is in keeping with the clinical presentation or not. 35% in our study mentioned parasites as pathogens, so that's slightly higher than the 13% in the earlier study, but it's definitely not what most people say. We had 17% who had inanimate pathogens. No infections were found in that group of 148. Now, the CFC did an interesting study. Actually, it was put forward uh, by Hillary Clinton uh, when she was uh, still a senator. And um, she wanted to make sure that the CFC actually investigated Morgellons. And so they did and put quite a few million dollars into that study, which was eventually published by Pearson. No infections or infestations were found in almost 140 patients with self-declared Morgellons disease. Only one person had a positive Borrelia test, and that was not deemed to be uh, explanatory for the symptoms. So the conclusion that they drew was that uh, Morgellons is very clearly a subtype of delusional infestation. Now, I thought that that was a very convincing paper, and Morgellons certainly looks very much like delusional infestation to me, and that's how I treat it, and most people I know do the same. We found that drug use is common in uh, delusion infestation patients. Now, interestingly, uh, the, um, the distribution of drug use is very much the same as in the normal population. So you have a predominance of younger males, for example, but interestingly, you have about three times more drug use than you get in the normal population. So we do deal with a group that is more likely to be taking stimulant drugs that cause those symptoms. And stimulants are one of the most common reasons for secondary delusion infestation, so it's not really surprising. We've also done a lot of work into uh, MRI studies, and we now know pretty well where the dysfunctional ne ne neuronal network systems are that mediate the symptoms. I don't want to go into this now because uh, it's um, quite a highly specialized, uh, specialized field and I would need another 20 minutes or so, and I don't think it's actually worth it. But I just want you to know that if you are interested, there are plenty of publications now where we can say, uh, this is this is the part of the brain that mediates the symptoms. By proxy presentations are not uncommon. It's about 15% uh, of proxy and shared delusions together. By proxy is between five and eight percent. And it's not uncommon with pets either. So where people think that it's the pet that's actually infested. And the most important and maybe best news is that antipsychotics are very effective in primary delusion infestation and also in secondary delusion infestation. So there is very effective treatment available. Uh, when we looked at our own patients in our clinic, um, we had 75 patients up to 2017. We now have about 100, uh, but in 2017, 69% were given the formal diagnosis of delusion infestation. So these were people who had been triaged with the idea that they would be particularly likely to have delusion infestation. Now, as you can see, roughly 70% did, and 61% of those who turned up for follow-up had an improvement in symptoms, and the improvement was usually very significant. 
So these people got a lot better. Obviously, we lost 39% to follow up, but that's a lot better than what you would normally get in uh, standard care, where you can only roughly help about 5% if you're lucky. So 61% is a lot better than five. And I think it shows that those specialist clinics do work for, for patients. We found that the DI patients were more impaired at baseline. So we looked at CGI scores. And uh, for those not familiar with CGI scores, they go from one to seven. One is basically uh, that you're not ill and seven means it's one of the illest patients you've ever seen. So our uh, DI patients had an average score, baseline score of about five, whereas the non-DI patients had a score of about four. And the average improvement that we got was about three CGI scores. So that was quite a large improvement, roughly from five, which is very ill, to two, which is borderline ill, on, on average, of course. Health anxiety was the commonest diagnosis in those that di we didn't think had DI. So that's what most of uh, the rest was. It was actually half of all others. And then there were um, a whole host of other problems. Uh, there was one with schizophrenia, I think, one with a thyroid problem, uh, one had IBS and other, other things like that. So, so these are the uh, exact results, but these are not just from our Liverpool clinic. This is from a bigger sample of about 200 patients from five clinics across Europe. And there's two in the UK. Uh, there was one in Russia, one in Italy and one in Germany. We got all those together and uh, you can see that the changes uh, for those people who had the symptoms for a relatively short time were better than those who've had them for a relatively long time. DUP means duration of untreated psychosis. So this is the time that the patient had the symptoms, but no treatment. So the difference is between 3.3 change for those under one year to 2.2 for those who had the illness for over five years untreated. And that difference was statistically significant. So you can still help the people who have had symptoms for over five years, but it is better to do it quicker. So there's a very clear message here, treat as early as you can to get the best outcomes. The other thing we found was that younger people had better outcomes than older people. Um, but younger people also seem to have had uh, shorter du uh, durations of untreated psychosis, probably because they go to the doctors earlier. Now this is the track up to Snowden on a uh, Saturday, I think, which is a bit of a procession when the weather's good. Snowden's the highest mountain in Wales with uh, about 1100 meters. So what's that in feet? I think three and a half thousand, something like that. So that's a walk that I've done a lot of times and looking forward to doing again soon. Now we get to the treatment and towards the end of the uh, talk so that we've got enough time for questions. The main message is that antipsychotics work and it doesn't really matter too much which one you use. The choice is more with regard to potential side effects. Uh, they do work and to give you a rough idea, about 70 to 80 percent have either a response or a remission with medication. I think it's probably higher because um, we find that when we give people depot injections, they have a higher response rate of over 90%. So there is probably a degree of non-compliance in, uh, uh, in those that don't respond. Rapport and engagement are essential because 
we need to persuade the patient to take the medication and that is the big problem. How can we persuade them to take something for an illness they don't think they have? So that is the real challenge. We do always examine all specimens uh, within reason, obviously, but we do that because it's a very important aspect of making sure that we have a relationship going with the patient. Dermatological complications are common and need treatment and can always be a way into a rapport with the patient. We obviously need to treat comorbidities and trigger factors, particularly uh, treatable illnesses and substance misuse. When we look at the antipsychotics to use, because this is such a dopaminergic problem, we normally use amisulpride over here, uh, which is the only antipsychotic that only works on uh, dopamine and no other receptors. And it's quite good in terms of side effects as well. I don't think it's available in the States, but its predecessor sulpiride is available and has a very similar effect. The most data is available for ulanzapin and risperidone as well as for pimazide, but we don't use pimazide any longer because of its relatively poor side effect profile, particularly in the elderly. So we normally use amisulpride, ulanzapine or risperidone, but it wouldn't be unreasonable to use sulpiride or haloperidol as well. I think it's important that you use one drug that you feel happy with and familiar with and then see how that goes. We use far lower doses than what we would use in schizophrenia, and that's what we say to patients. We say it's a bit like aspirin. It works for the heart in low doses and for pain in high doses. This is the same. You haven't got schizophrenia, but we use the medication for distress and for this itching and for these types of symptoms in much lower doses. And, we, and, the, and the dosing is usually about a third of what we would use as a maximum dose in schizophrenia. So about 30%. So in olanzapine, we'd use five or 7.5% instead of 20. Uh, in say amisulpride, we'd use 400 instead of 1200 milligrams. Uh, but I'm talking about maximum doses in Europe. I know that in the United States, maximum doses can sometimes be twice the doses that we use over here. Consider compliance is really important because we find that sometimes changing the substance works. And that is probably because people haven't been taking the first drug, but they're taking the second one. So you need to engage the patient. That is the most important thing. And if you want to do something for it, then you need to treat it. Don't refer the patient to a psychiatrist because they won't go. So if you want to get rid of the patient, refer them to a psychiatrist. But if you want to help them, then you need to somehow uh, find a way to get rapport and then uh, treat the patient yourself or get someone uh, who can help the patient like a primary care physician, for example. When you approach the patient and when they ask you what's wrong with them, um, it is possibly wise to have a gradual disclosure of the real diagnosis and to use kind of either just the patient's own words. Uh, for example, patient believes he's infested or she's infested or uh, something like um, uh, an unexplained uh, dermatological symptom or something like that, so that you don't put the pe put the pe the patient off by calling it delusional. We sometimes also try to explore how much the patient is willing to explore alternative explanations other than theirs for their symptoms, and we say things like, "Okay, there's multiple reasons." We haven't found an infestation, but of course it, it's always possible that it might be a hitherto unknown infestation. You might have had one in the past and now you're suffering from residual neurological symptoms from that, or it could be that you have a disorder in the brain that might be giving you those symptoms and that's well described. So that's what we sometimes do. 
But by and large, we find that the more opaque we are about the diagnosis, the more successful the treatment seems to be. The use of mental health legislation can be necessary when the suffering and the loss of social function is particularly severe or when there's risk to others or the patient because of suicidal ideation, which is not uncommon. So this is the uh, end of my talk and uh, I think we can now move to the questions. So I will try to come out of the show and end the uh, sharing. Okay. I don't know whether this has worked now. It, uh, Peter, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. All right. Um, yes, it worked. And, you know, Peter, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. It was very enlightening. Um, we do have some questions. Um, a question one is, do you have experience with delusions about chemical hazard exposure? Um, I would think that this would be very hard to disprove. There are so many possible chemicals to which one might be exposed. Sorry, yeah. there are some chemicals that can actually give you delusions, but that would be a secondary delusional illness. And for example, uh, the most common for that is heavy lead, uh, uh, heavy metal poisonings like lead, lead poisonings or iron poisonings. So if they are significant, then you can actually get proper delusional uh, beliefs as a consequence of that but it's far more common that people it it seems to be a fashionable thing that people have what i would consider to be environmental allergies people think that there is a reason in the environment and that's why they have certain symptoms but there isn't actually any clear clear evidence of exposure and there isn't any clear evidence that that's causing the symptoms. So people might say someone sneezed on the other side of the road and ever since then I've not been the same. Mm -hmm. Or I think there might have been chemicals in the factory where I worked and I've never been the same since. But that isn't really exposure. But if you can prove a, a high degree of heavy metals in in the blood or the hair then a really high level particularly of lead can cause brain damage and it can cause delusions thank you this the next question is are there cross-cultural studies on delusional infestation and to what extent are symptoms a result of contextual or cultural factors there are um, we have uh, worked with friends in India, for example. The presentation is exactly the same. So there is no difference. There is no, uh, and some of the evidence actually for, uh, for antipsychotics comes from India. So it presents in exactly the same way despite the fact that you might expect a slightly higher degree of prevalence of, uh, of parasites in the environment in, in, in India, for example. But there are a lot of psychiatric illnesses where cr cross-cultural issues are overrated and actually people present exactly the same wherever they are. There are other things where the presentations aren't the same, but for most things, they're exactly the same. And for delusion infestation, we have evidence that they're exactly the same. 
so in many respects, it's, it's, we're bit, it's a human thing. It's a human aspect rather than a cultural. The, the medical aspect is the... Yes, the and, we have, and we have evolved from apes. Let's not forget that. So I, I, I know that some of your states are big on, uh, on creationism, <laughs> but I think it's probably more likely that we've evolved from apes and they are really into into uh, making sure that they get rid of their fleas and things, aren't they? So I think we are actually uh, evolutionary evolved to find things on our skin and in our hair. Yep. Um, well, in fact, we have, you know, the, the flat fingernails is part of that whole evolution of grooming. You know, yes. fingernails have adapted to that. So we're yeah. very groovy creatures. Um, all right, let's move forward. Uh, the co questions are flooding in. Um, question four, describe the English medical system and how it uh, is effective in intercepting delusions of infestation cases. Okay, uh, it is better placed than the United States to intercept, but it's not perfect at all. So because we have a system where you can only really see a specialist if you go to your primary care physician first, uh, there is a filtering mechanism and your primary care physician then sends you off to a specialist like a dermatologist. But that dermatologist then needs to be confident enough to treat your delusions and not just refer you on to a psychiatrist where the patient then never turns up. Um, we haven't got a lot of private health care, so people can't just do the doctor hopping as easily as in other health care uh, systems. So I think we are probably a little bit better off in that sense, uh, but people still manage somehow to send stuff to private labs or to or to pass the doctors of all specialities. Uh, but it is certainly more difficult when you only have one primary route into seeing a specialist. Yeah, I agree. I, here in the States, um, it's not unusual for me to have patients have seen at least uh, 17 doctors prior to ending up at my desk. So doctor hopping uh, is a very common feature of DI cases here in the States. Um, question number... Uh, five, do you suspect there would be an increase in self-diagnosed Morgellons worldwide if the information available online was translated into more non-Germanic languages, a sort of hypochondriac effect? Yes, is the short answer. <laughs> because these are things that get passed on via Facebook and other groups of people who are then absolutely convinced that 300 friends on Facebook can't be wrong. And so that's that's how it how it spreads. So um, but it is a, a fact that 45 percent of all content on the Internet is in English and another almost 20 percent is German. So the rest makes up a much, much lesser pool. But yes, when it gets translated, that's when you have the uh, issues. And I'm sure it'll happen. Yeah, I get a lot of people who go onto chat rooms and they, you know, yeah. the um, confirmation bias kicks right in. Um, and yeah. they kvetch together and they all convince themselves that they are, there's a serious problem. Um, number six, are there many cases where DI is caused by an actual infestation that later leads to DI? Uh, no, but yep. in order to keep rapport with the patient, we never exclude it outright. Because very often we're in the Carl Jaspers dilemma that we're not in a position where we can prove the impossibility of what happened. So, mm -hmm we basically just say, look, we don't know whether you might have had something a year ago when it all started, uh, but we won't be able to prove it either way. So how can we help you now? And so, uh, but there are very 
I mean, I have not actually heard of a single case. I've never treated a single case where we had a confirmed infestation that then later caused problems. But I've had a few cases where I certainly wouldn't have wanted to rule it out categorically. I have had one or two cases where they've had an encounter, an unpleasant encounter, such as um, stinging caterpillars, and then um, it, it brought into a tendency that they had, a anxiety that became DI later on. Yeah, that is much, yeah, that is much more likely that there is an event that isn't in yes. itself an infestation, but but might actually change this prediction and the reality yep. testing of that prediction. And they shift. Yes. Um, number seven, is there any help or support for family members of a person suffering from this condition? And do you have any recommendations for them on how to handle their family <clears throat> member, patient, friend, colleague? Yeah, uh, there is no support, unfortunately. We always encourage the uh, patient to allow a family member to come in because it's very important that they hear what we say because otherwise they will get fed a particular story that is usually changed because of the delusional elaboration of the patient. And it's very helpful to have the relatives there uh, because whether they confirm or don't, usually they don't come they don't confirm, but if they do and they share the delusion, it's it's also important. So we always encourage it. But of course, if the patient says no, there's nothing much we can do. Um, we we never ever encourage people to pretend that something is isn't there uh, is there when it is. So we never confirm the delusion. We would be more likely to agree to disagree or to say well. Who knows? But I can't see evidence, medical evidence of an infestation. And I think it's important to say that. So we do that with the relatives as well and say we cannot find evidence of an infestation. Uh, my work with families, um, those DI cases that can recover, I found that the um, working with family members that are w working with me has made a big difference in the recovery of a person who has DI. It almost always helps to have them on yeah. board. But sometimes... Yeah, isolated. Uh, yeah. Yeah, people who I found who have isolated themselves, they're much harder to get out of that rabbit hole. Indeed. Uh, question number eight. This is more of a question, sort of a comment or a statement. A type two pyrethroids can cause symptoms of paresthesia. Citizens unwittingly treating their clothing to prevent bed bugs um, can then trigger the symptoms which might lead to a psychosis. Um, is there any thoughts on furthering yeah, uh, that? Any, anything that causes paresthesia is a, is a potential trigger. Yeah. And I have seen quite a lot of people who spend an enormous amount of money on, on treating their clothes and their bedding, changing it all the time. And I think it's important to say to people that um, they clearly have had no evidence that that uh, changing of clothes helped, particularly not in the long run. What you can sometimes get is a, is a certain dampening down of the delusional intensity by doing something that you think will be effective. But so so they say, oh yes, it did work. It was a little better when I changed the bedding, but then two days later I was back to square one. And then you think, ah yes, because their delusional intensity has gone up and they say, no, because of the life cycle of the parasite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that one. And this will be our last question. Uh, anybody who has uh, questions that have not answered, um, I will read through them and pass them on to Peter. But this is the last question. It's a little lengthy. Um, people may see delusional infestation as a negative. Or what is your estimate of the harm of delusion infestation to the benefit of overly concerned people who catch the real disease? 
for example, believing that you are infected with fleas and are not versus people who are infested with fleas and are not concerned resulting in disease. Do your studies show the results of cases where a person really saved themselves from harm? Are Swiss people paranoid about cleanliness or is it a good idea? Um, <laughs> I'll try to answer that. Um, now, um, I would say that the first thing to do is to actually apply the diagnostic criteria for a delusion. And it's important here that from a psychiatric point of view that we look at it on a on a sliding scale. So this is a categoric. This is not a categorical thing, even though we obviously have to call it that at some point. But we need to realize that the reality is that the delusional in intensity shifts and before it becomes a fully fixed delusion, we, we call it an overvalued idea, but that's just another category. In reality, the, the, the way in which the thought is fixed in your head is somewhat between zero and 100. You can compare that with a conspiracy theorist. No one ever landed on the moon. Do you believe that a little bit? Do you believe it a lot? Do you believe it with absolute certainty? So you can see how how many people would land on a scale, excuse the pun, with with the uh, question of whether the landing on the moon ever happened. And the same is true for these type of patients. So are we talking about someone with health anxiety who has a few fleas in the house and gets really upset about it? Or are we dealing with someone who has a fixed delusion um, that he's infested when they're clearly not. Those are ve two very different pair of shoes and very different patients. One needs to be treated for an anxiety disorder. The other one needs to be treated for a delusional disorder. So it's important to get the diagnosis right in order to get the right treatment to the, to the patient. When it comes to cleanliness, uh, I know that different cultures have different ideas of cleanliness. I know that the Swiss are particularly keen on cleanliness, but that, as far as I know, is not causing an increase in proper delusional cases. I don't know Swiss data about health anxieties around cleanliness, but my assumption would be that it's more likely that you get people who are somewhat obsessional about cleanliness rather than people who get delusional more because delusion seems seem to be caused by spe by specific changes in the brain that seem to be cross-cultural. Now in India for example it's strange because people are exceedingly clean in their own houses but not in the outside environment and um, that is really interesting because there we have, again, we have the same prevalence. But I don't know about health. I know that health anxiety is more common there, but that has different uh, reasons. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question a little bit. I think the diagnosis is key. Are we looking at a delusion or are we looking at a health anxiety? That is what we need to decide because the treatment is different because it's a different illness. Peter, I think this is it. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk and uh, the questions were excellent. So it was an excellent yes, uh, presentation and you know, thank you very much. Um, you certainly using the internet uh, rather than using a megaphone of a three mile, thousand mile di distance. <laughs> that would be physically very interesting, but um, terrific. Um, I, I really appreciated the international aspect of this conversation because it really is a worldwide issue. It's not just, you know, local. And um, your work has been uh, extremely uh, forward looking and has brought delusion of infestations um, to the fore. And, uh, you know, we're actually about to uh, publish a guidebook for doctors here in the States 
uh, on uh, delusions and infestations, and we're working on the text at this time. So hopefully we'll be able to bring it more up into the medical um, focus so that more people can mm -hmm. be caught and uh, cared for um, and then brought back to lives and quality of life that people can, uh, you know, go on and enjoy. So Peter, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.